you can send me recording your voice. <laughs> yes, I have my hand raised. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I started recording now, and this is, I'm going to talk about the walk cycle. And I'm going to, like, uh, exactly like I did last week, I'm going to talk about it in a very traditional animation uh, point of view. But we have Quill here, so we can put something, uh, like do some examples and stuff uh, using Quill, which is great. So we can see how that specifically translates to the workflow here, right? So what can we talk about first? There's so many things to, to start with in, in the walk cycle. Oh yeah, uh, Sam, I read your message, um, and I will yeah I will cover that today hopefully. Yeah, I literally just watched your previous one like an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> keep keep what do you my think? head in that mindset. Okay, was it was it useful or? <laughs> oh yeah, like every I always learn something new every time. Yeah, that's great. Oh, thank and, you. This one I'm I'm excited for because I was doing a walk cycle. Oh, the last right. thing I was doing. Yeah, um, like I said last week, most of the stuff I'm going to talk about is you can find it in every book, animation book. Uh, hey Daniel, just quickly on your OBS, um, your window seems to be like a little bit scaled. So oh, okay. It has a red frame. See that red frame? You okay. might be able to just scale it all the way so it's full screen. Okay, let me see. Transform uh, fit to screen. All right? No. I think in the OBS main window, you can just grab the edges of the, the red edge and then just scale. Yeah, exactly. Oh. And then move it, move it now. Grab it and move it on the canvas. Yes, oh. and make it smaller again. Oh, you have like a weird resolution, actually. Okay, let me see. There should be a way to automatically. Hang on. If you if you go to transform and you go to stretch to screen. No. I think that's. No. There's some. It's it's okay. I think you know. It's just it I'm just OCD like about this. Versus full screen. <laughs> Fit to screen. Just... No, shouldn't be. No. Isn't it there? Kind a... of. Oh, Isn't there... you have. Yeah. Oh. Perfect. Yay. Is it good enough? Oh, it was. Good enough. <laughs> oh, good no. enough. <laughs> it's good enough. Let's 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 go. <laughs> oh no. I wonder why this happens. This is good. No. <laughs> I thought it was already automatically stretching to fit the window. Hmm. I think it's good, Daniel. Let, let's keep going. This is good enough. Yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, we'll see the recording later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. What was I saying? Uh, yeah. So let's talk about first balance. In a, we, uh, obviously, I'm going to talk about biped characters, not not quadruped, no creatures. Just going to talk about human, just basic human me body mechanics, right? Uh, let's get this guy here in the center because I want to talk about the center of balance first of all, which is really, really important to. Oh, somebody has the hot mic. So if we do an um, actual line here that's really perpendicular to the to the ground plane, this line uh, will uh, represent more or less the center of balance, right? So each character has, let's put this in another layer. Oh no, that's not what I wanted. Okay. So each, each character has a center of balance, right? Um, the legs, the, the main function of the legs in human beings are to keep the body from falling, right? Because we, and also to, as a means of transportation, obviously. But um, if you see a person that's completely still, not walking, just kind of standing there, you will see that the center of balance is constantly like shifting, right? Um, 
there's like a slight shift from left to right, forward, backwards, right? So the basically the legs are, you have to imagine like the legs are always keeping the body from falling in any direction. So let's say we are in, um, in a plane, right? And the plane is turning. So you're, or you're in a boat and the boat is kind of swaying, right? So the, the body goes this way. Mm -hmm. So the legs, what happens is they try to always, well, first of all, they, they bend, obviously they're flexible, right? Um, you know what? Let's keep this in a separate layer. It'll be easier. It'll be easier to do that, right? So yes, same if you go if we really going off balance, the legs are gonna always try to catch up and always try to keep the body on the balance. But there's a moment, even the body sometimes like what it does is, um, you know what? Let's get the Let's do this with this. Sometimes the body, what it does is rotate the other way. So that way you keep that balance, right? So you the center of gravity here kind of goes from there and it moves over here. So we keep that balance there. So what happens if the body really goes off balance, like really like way off the center of gravity? So the center of gravity moves over here, but you know, there's a big change here. So let's go to the legs. What's gonna happen here, they're, they're gonna go so far away, you can't really keep up with that. There's a moment where the body completely goes off balance. Right? So what's gonna happen? The leg needs to move and change to another position. And the foot needs to plant on the ground and that what it does is avoid the body from falling. So now we change, thanks to that leg changing to another pivot point, we allow the center of gravity to go back to normal so we can keep that balance and keep the body from falling. So that's the main theory. Uh, center of, of gravity. Just want to remember what's that. Same thing if we go the other way, you know, uh, the legs go this way, but there's only so much that they can do. So there's a moment where then the leg needs to catch up and pick up the body's uh, weight from falling. So what happens when uh, let's go, let's put this back here. They always try to keep the character in balance. So what happens when the body uh, goes off balance, not only side to side, but also forward, right? We're going forward. So the legs, they have to do the same. They have to, first of all, they pivot and they rotate, obviously, because they are attached to the body. Oop. They're attached to the body, right? But we are going to get to a point where the body is like completely going off balance and we, it's going to fall over. It's going to go on the ground. So the legs, they need to, again, be as, just imagine the legs are being these tripods that are con constantly moving and constantly automatically catching the body from falling on the ground. So. So the, in order to avoid the falling on the ground, the leg goes forward automatically without even thinking. This is all automatic movements, right? The, the, the brain almost doesn't even participate in this. These are very natural and automatic motions that we do without even thinking. So the leg moves forward and that way the body can fall without a problem. And because the body has weight, obviously, it's going to go down and it's going to cause the legs, obviously, to, to bend, right? 
and the knee will go there. So that's kind of the basic idea of balance, right? So once the leg is moving forward and is keeping the body in balance, the, the, the center of gravity goes back to more or less in between the two legs and in the center of the body, right? So the mission of the legs is always catching the body's weight. So if you think about that, this is, I think it's easier to understand the, the main mechanics of a walk cycle and the and the, the mechanic the the concept and the theory behind a walk, right? Uh, what I wanted to do as well is say, okay, what happens after that? After the, so we're gonna do um. Let me just do legs again. Just gonna. Well, one thing is important is how does a character start to walk from the very beginning, right? That's another thing that we're just gonna put this guy here. And we're going to start to do keyframes because at the moment I was just in the first frame. Um, and the way a character starts to work from from uh, not moving, from not walking, how, do, how, do, how does he start working? Uh, it's exactly the same, like I said. There's, um, we have a, a body that's in balance, everything is in balance, but suddenly it goes off balance. So that's how a character starts working, just by going off balance. So this is your anticipation of the walk, right? And then eventually the next keyframe, you do, you put the, the, the leg forward so that, so that character doesn't fall. And not only it doesn't fall, but it transports, it kind of travels forward. So that's the main intention of the character to travel forward, right? I'm not going to talk about the arms for now. I'm just going to talk about uh, legs and, and body only. So let's just get rid of the arms for now. I don't want to over overload with information. So what's going to happen after? So the intention is to keep moving forward. So the next frame. After this leg has catch the weight of the body, the, the body is now able to keep moving forward because he has this momentum from this fall. So a walk is a series of falls, very controlled falls. Right? So now here the leg is bending because we're catching the weight of the body. And what happened with the other leg? The, the other leg it's peels off the body the, the floor. And that's very important to remember. Just say it's, it, it's used to be stuck on the floor, used to be glued on the floor. It peels off, peels off that floor, right? So what happens with that? It's basically this leg does not have the weight of the body anymore. The weight of the body is in one leg only. So in the next uh, keyframe, what we're gonna do is we keep the momentum forward, and this leg it doesn't have the restraint from being on the ground anymore. It's not attached to the ground, so this leg is free to travel, propel itself forward. And the intention of this leg is gonna be to catch the weight cuts the the fall for the next the next fall because the body is going to throw itself back in the off balance right and rinse and repeat you know the, the body falls off balance and this leg comes to the rescue and catches that fall and this leg is just pivoting for now And we'll talk about the rotation of the pelvis later, but I want you guys to just get that first concept of 
falling. Basically, a walk cycle is a bunch of controlled falls that are automatically saved by the legs. And the legs, once the once the, the weight is caught and the gravity is balanced, what this leg does not only peels from the ground, but also helps the body propel forward. Because this this leg peels from the ground but also pushes is doing a push action here. And then you will see later uh, how we we're going to do that. And the push is started by the heel. The heel is the one really pushing the, the body forward. All these muscles here in the, in, the, in, the, in the foot, all those muscles on the legs are fired. And here, is the, the, this leg is the one making the effort. And this one, its mission is to catch the weight of the body. So each leg has a, a mission in every step and every in every part of the of the cycle. So that is pushing the body forward, and again we just transfer the weight, and the, the cycle begins again. This leg goes back again into this leg goes goes back again forward to catch the weight, and or the cycle repeats over and over in a supernatural and mechanic way that is a completely un uh, we are not even conscious of it uh daniel quick question about your approach here um because you're doing like straight ahead animation right now just for teaching purposes i suppose but yes if you plan out a shot you would do still post to post and straight ahead in between right yeah we're gonna do that now but first let me see if i can switch hopefully this works does it? We're looking at a black screen. screen right now. Oh, no. That's not good. Uh-oh. Uh Why is it black screen? It worked so well last week. No, it's black still. OK, let me see. I'm Properties. assuming it's a walk cycle sheet. <laughs> is that what you're going to show? <laughs> no. Hang on one second. Properties. Okay. Why is it not showing the proper? Oh no, it worked so well last week. <laughs> I can't believe it. Is it because you're full screen or windowed maybe? Yeah, somehow OBS is not catching the window that I wanted to catch. Um, oh, we see a oh, wait. player now. Oh, yeah. I think that's probably just because it's VLC. It's not. Maybe. But, the, no? but, it, but it, it's it, a black screen. It's a black screen. Yeah, okay. it's, not, it's not getting the contents of the window, huh? I yeah, tested, I tested back, it. But it's not... I tested it before, guys, and it worked. So it's completely that's missing. Always, always like that. <laughs> I tested it, worked perfectly. I started the stream and it's not working now, huh? So, that, so my computer is messing with me right now. Try opening it on another video program? Yeah, let me do another capture. And let's do, no, let's do. Uh, Maybe you can project the VLC window directly instead of going through the OBS projector. Yeah. One second. Yeah, uh, but it's still black though. Mm. Yeah, something is not. Something with window capture is not working. So okay, let's do. Uh, okay. Even dash is, is not working either now. <laughs> oh, that's bizarre. Uh, okay, so let's take the headset off. I didn't want to do this. Okay, let's do.
Uh, you have to switch your microphone, Daniel. He yeah. can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yep. yep. And there's a screen, mm -hmm. like, like a still screen of somebody barefoot. <laughs> yes. All right. So I know this is not ideal, but I um, just want to show you guys the whole, all the concepts that I talked about, just see that emotion, right? See how the weight goes forward. The legs are coming to the rescue, catching the weight exactly at the right time in order for the other leg to peel off the, the ground. It just all happens so fast, but it's so natural, right? And we don't even, we take all of that for granted, but I think it's good to study this and analyze it, right? Let's have a look at frame by frame. Uh, let's see if that, this, this worked before. Let's see if it works now. Uh, let's see. Okay, <laughs> so you can see now how the the back foot is peeling off the ground. Well, this one lands on the floor, catches the weight, and the other foot transfer to the next position of of the step, so it catches the body. The heel is the first thing to touch the ground, and there is a f there is one frame where both the toes are up and uh, the heel is up, but that lasts for a very very short time. Immediately the toes go into the ground to completely flatten the foot on the ground, right? So that means that the whole weight of the body is on that leg now, and the other leg is free to release the ground and also propel the body forward, transferring the weight. And again, the heel goes first. The first thing to touch the ground is the heel. And then we go back to the cycle again. And now BLC doesn't work anymore. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Can we have more problems? Thank you. <laughs> So, any questions about all of that stuff? All good? It's very I'm good. good. Everything <laughs> is very obvious, yeah. right? Everything's very okay. It's very obvious until you see animations of people and they're doing it completely wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, it seems very obvious, but you have to really, um, let's see, OBS. Window projector and uh, quill. Okay. Okay. So let's do a. I think let's do an animation so it will be so we can then put that to practice into actual quill. And then I wanted to also create a, a character that's easy to animate and three-dimensional, because at the moment this guy is just a flat sketch. So let's do a proper character, right? Uh, just going to keep it really simple. Uh, let's keep the sketch. And this also shows my normally my workflow. I normally have like a very rough sketch. Uh, which is not not necessarily three dimensional, just to just to have an idea. And then when I do the actual character, I, I kind of uh, turn down the opacity and I I create the actual character here. Right. Um, just gonna start with simple straight line. To create just the basic shapes. And this goes for any time you want to create a character. Just try to think about what's the most efficient way that I can do it without necessarily using a ton of strokes and a ton of geometry. I mean, sometimes there's no option. 
and you have to do it, but okay. And I'm just gonna keep this card there really, really simple. And I'm gonna do everything in one layer. There's obviously more different ways to do this. We can do different layers, we can do transform keys, we can do all that fancy stuff. But for this class, I think I'm just gonna keep it really. And I, actually, I'm gonna pose him already into into the first position. Maybe there's no need for this. Maybe I can just do the knee by just making this a little. See, we got a knee now. Can be a little, can be a little fatter here. And the uh, foot, what would be the best way to do foot, Goro? <laughs> Just taper it, exactly, you got it. <laughs> Just like that, right? Doesn't Perfect. need to be. Okay, so there's some naming convention, um, naming conventions, no, how do you say? Um, yeah. Conventions uh, in, in classical animation, we call the different parts of the walk cycle um, like this part here, we call it the stride, stride position, right? So the stride position, one leg is straight, catching out the body weight, and the heel is just contact on the ground. It's just happened, right? It's the first time the uh, the foot contacts the ground. And the other leg is on the back and it's slightly bent. And like we saw in the live action footage, the heel, it's starting to, oh. Oh, that's not, he doesn't like that. Let's do this. Yeah, no, he doesn't like bend. Doesn't like bending too much, huh? Maybe if we do this he guy. Grab radius. Maybe if we do the guy, this guy really big, he will have more geometry, maybe. Am I right? It's a bit better, right? So that's interesting. If you do a big stroke, it yeah, makes it, more geometry. The the amount of geometry it kind of depends on the scale in which you're you're building. Also, not just the scale, but also um, the speed. It doesn't apply to the uh, line tool. But if you use a brush and you move your hand really slow, it's much higher res than if you move your hand very fast. Be aware of that. If you want to work efficiently, you know, um, try not to do like super slow strokes. And yeah. with this new wireframe view that um, uh, that Danielle is using right now, you can actually see the resolution. Yeah. You can see how you can, it's if you much can just dense quickly here. create a line stroke, um, small, just to show what the geometry looks like in small. Uh, I mean, uh, 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 straight line, huh? Yeah, straight line and. Um, yeah, but zoom in. Yeah, so it's like pretty low res there. Yeah. You see the mm. difference to the foot. So if we do the same straight line but really huge, well, we scale it down to the same size as the other line that I did, and you can see the difference in in density, right? So that mm -hmm. allows you to more or less choose if whether you want a higher higher res strokes or, or lower res strokes, right? So so here these are kind of low res and this one is a little higher res. Okay, that's a good thank you. That's a good trick for optimization. Okay, so every time we pose this stride position, we have to look at it from both sides, not just one make sure that everything is correct. So bearing in mind the center of gravity, we want to make sure that the 
character is actually on balance. It's not off balance, right? Uh, maybe this foot is a little too huge. Huh? Okay. And I'm using the guide as a as a means for me to understand where the ground is. Okay, so there's two ways to do this. Um, we could do the character walking forward in space, and he he would actually move forward, or we can do the walk cycle on the spot, which is also um, pretty useful to do it this way because you can have a very long walk cycle and then use the transform key to actually propel uh, the character forward and that way you save a lot of geometry. So that's a optimization trick that you could do because the cycle only needs to happen once. All, all, the, all the frames need to happen once only. So the rest will be just a repetition of the cycle. So we could do that in, on the spot. So we have to imagine that the floor is moving forward constantly, right? In that direction. Let's use this as a... It's always moving in that direction, right? So, uh, this is the stride position. Let's name this. Pop, 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 pop. And just kind of keep an eye on the time as well. I don't want to go. So, we're already half an hour in. Okay, <laughs> let's see if I can do at least the, the main keyframes in another half an hour. And then we can go to questions after. Okay, second uh, important phase of the walk cycle, we call it the passing position. And the, uh, it's called like that because it's kind of passing the weight from one leg to another, right? So in the passing position, normally there's a tendency of the body going down. It's kind of because it's kind of catching the weight and it's kind of going down. But there's also different versions of the walk cycle where in the passing position you go up. So it can be, it can be either way. And each character is going to have a different way of walking that's going to really determine his, his or her personality, right? So that's another thing that to bear in mind. When you do a walk cycle, you have to bear, uh, take in account the personality of the character, whether the character is heavy or it's light, is it a female character, is it a male character? Um, everything that you can think of, you have to uh, bear in mind, right? Because that all of that is going to affect um, the way he walks, he or she. Um, okay, from the front, how does that look? So. So the foot should travel in a straight line because we are established that the floor is moving that way, right? So let's make sure the foot is traveling on that straight line. And then um, the weight here, you can see that is slightly off balance. You see the line and the body is so slightly to the right right now. So I'm gonna fix that by just moving the body slightly here so we keep the balance centered so what's going to happen the legs are going to pivot because they're always attached to the hips so we have a slight movement sideways on the passing position so here we are completely centered completely on balance on the next pose on the passing position we are slightly side on the side on this leg. This leg is catching the weight. This leg is the one, at, the, at this point in time, this leg is the one making all the effort to make sure the body doesn't fall. Hey, Daniel, for the people that are new to animation, could you elaborate a little bit the two, the difference between the two workflows you just did? Like right now you're doing like passing position and contact position, but before you did straight ahead. Just yes. um, to differentiate those two approaches. Yeah, yeah. That's really good. I, I, I forgot to mention that. Uh, yeah, at the moment I'm working only on keyframes, right? But th these are the uh, these are the keyframes that I'm working on for the walk cycle, but they're not 
these these two poses are not going to be next to each other on the timeline because at the moment this is frame number zero or frame number one sorry and this is frame number two obviously these are not going to be the real numbers right uh, this i will talk about the timing later but this is going to be a different point in time right so what i'm doing is planning my keyframes first and then later i will put those keyframes in the right timing so the we have a nice rhythm so that's it's called uh keyframe by keyframe or organized post to pose uh post to pose uh planning animation whatever you i mean there's many ways to call it i guess but yeah post to pose i would say yeah is that right word can you quickly talk about the advantages uh, of straight ahead versus post to pose vice versa yeah post to pose allows you to really plan your animation and plan the timing of your animation before you add all the in-betweens right so now i'm planning this walk cycle um, and i only gonna do like three or four poses And with the with this uh, with the little amount of poses, you can really plan your whole animation, and you can really see whether it's too slow or too fast early in the game, right? And that's the benefit of planning things ahead of time and doing this post-to-post -post workflow that I'm showing right now. So it's uh, uh, let's see if you. And to piggyback on that, um, the first approach that Danielle used, like the straight ahead, is also useful, and it's it's actually super fun to animate like that sometimes, because you like if you don't if you don't plan your animation and you go straight ahead, and you just let the basically let your hand dictate what's going to happen. Sometimes it's really beneficial to do straight ahead animation, and the key difference is straight ahead animation will, in general, look more lively because it's more spontaneous and uh, um, volumes change a little bit, you know, the size and stuff like that, because you draw every frame from scratch yeah. and uh, repose it, but it has some a different type of charm in it yeah. that um, versus um, post-to-post animation can look very controlled and too organized if you don't do it right. Yeah. So. A healthy, um, healthy approach is to do a little bit of both. Um, that's yep. what, what all animators do is like they plan out the animation post to post, but they do straight ahead animation in between yep. the poses, and that makes things like super, super lively and um, nice. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The, the 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 trick is to find the right balance, right, between the two approaches. Um, a straight ahead animation the main difference is it's almost like if you remember when you do a flip book and you're in the corner of a book right when you animate the flip book and you're in a corner or or, or just a a, a, a a school book or pad of paper uh you basically have a lot of empty pieces of paper right and then you start drawing and then you get you go to the next frame you you, you go to the next frame you get the and you start you start from frame number one, continue frame number two, number three, number four, etc. And that gives you this kind of uh, really improvised and fresh feel to your animation because you're just going with the flow. You're kind of figuring things out on the way, at the same time as you're animating, and not even planning too much. Just letting your imagination go and try to imagine that movement. Um, and that's more straight ahead, no? It's kind of more raw uh, drawing and then and, and kind of coming up with the movement on the spot, basically, right? That's Those why are... the people like at Leica and stuff, the people that do like stop motion, they're like super impressive because they do plan in their head because they can only do straight ahead with stop motion animation. Yeah. So like you can't pose things first and do the in-betweens. So um, it's it's much more challenging um, if you do stop motion. You actually need to buffer all that information a lot more than when you're using 3D tools like this. Exactly. Yeah, uh, Quill is also really great to do uh, straight ahead. You can totally 
do what I just did, you know, like uh, start with frame number one and kind of keep going, keep going until you get a movement that you like. Um, but yeah, it's good to combine both uh, planning and then straight ahead um, to really get the benefit of both things. Because obviously you need to plan, especially if you have a long scene and things need to happen at a certain time and you really need to plan that timing, right? So, okay, going back to this, the post uh, walk cycle positions, um, what I'm doing on the, str on the stride is making sure the, the mirror of the stride is is really a mirror. So so, so this, the stride position for the right leg needs to be in the same spot as the left leg. So here we have the right leg on the ghosting, and we have the left leg. And I tr I'm trying to make it make it almost identical, but not. Com it doesn't have to be perfect, right? Because you don't, you never want everything to be completely perfect. But but yeah, just it needs to be fairly close. So both stride positions they need to be very similar to each other, just mir a mirror version of it. Okay, so. And the other thing that I'm I'm looking at as well is the pit, the um, the socket on the hips it needs to move as well. So when the le when the leg moves forward, the socket of the leg also needs to travel forward in the body. And this is due to pelvis rotation. The the pelvis inside of the body kind of rotates as well. So you have to bear that in mind as well. So the the body is not rigid. It's also uh, able to twist, right? If you're imagine if we had some more detail here, we don't have detail, but I can really see the twisting, right? No. If you turn on the re real wireframe, you will be able to. Oh yeah, yeah, you can see the twisting there, right? So that's what happens with our bodies in real life. No, the, the they twist every time we do a step. So imagine this is the center of the body, so it, it's it's not. On the on the stride position, it's very much like this, right? So here it will be more in the center, and here it will be twisted again like that. Okay, uh, okay. So let's do. We need to have uh, the the mirror version of this. Which another a, tr a trick that we could do is just uh, deleting everything, just leave an empty frame, then, then selecting everything here, going here to frame number four, and use this button, which is basically your paste button, right? So that copies and pastes the same pose. So what uh, what I can do now is just kind of. Uh, mirror that. I'm gonna do it manually. I know it's possible to do it automatically, but I... it's gonna go fast. I think. You could also just um, move them over, right? <laughs> because they're like kind of symmetrical the legs, so you could just oh, yeah, swap right. the position. You know, you're it's absolutely like a right. Dirty way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually yeah, because in my head it's like, in my head in my head this one is still the uh, leg right. <laughs> so I I believe my character so much that I think this is the light, the right leg all the time. It's like <laughs> my time, I'm cheating. No, I'm cheating. And obviously I don't want it to be super perfect. And here, okay. Oh, it needs to be a slightly on the side, like we said before, slightly off balance. And the reason why it's off balance, I think I mentioned it, is because the body it's on it's on one leg only right now. The other leg is on the air. So once we remove, and and you can try that yourself if you if you lift one foot off the ground what's going to happen your body is going to switch the balance to a side to the side where the where your leg is on the ground right so that's exactly what happens and we need to feel that when you, when we flip the, the drawings right 
when we flip the drawings, we need to see that the weight shifting. Even with two drawings, you, you can already feel it, right? If this works, means that your poses are good. Okay, so now... We can go back to frame number one, right? So technically, <laughs> obviously, obviously that's too, it's too fast, right? So let's see how long we want to do this walk cycle. So timing, time, timing on a walk cycle, very important. Um, usually, usually we use 12 frame as a as a base and 12 frame per step right and but you know again like every character has their pace and every character is going to have their rhythm so uh, technically this one step is going to last for 12 frames so so this one we're going to keep it in frame number 6 on the passing position so I'm holding this frame, this keyframe, one, two, so five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, and we are in uh, 18 frames now. I know it's just f it's four frames per, hang on, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So we have six frame each each key, and the total is nineteen. So maybe it's a little slow. So we can remove one frame of each key. Let's see. Let's see. Maybe it will be like a slow pace walk. Oopa. I don't know. Hang on. I think we're missing something. And the last one has to hold, too. Yeah. The last that... one. Two, three, four, five, six. Okay. That could be a nice rhythm. Slightly fast. No, actually, no, it's good. No, it's good. Um, let me see. I'm seeing a couple of things. Obviously, this is not right. In theory, you can also just loop the layer, right? Like, I I see that you use the walk, walk uh, work area brackets for this, but. Um, advantage of if you use uh, looping um, of the layer, then you will see the uh, looping frame as well right, at the end when you get to the last frame. Yeah. No, I, I wanted to do this because I, I wasn't sure of the timing. OK. So, so now it's a matter of checking if those keyframes are good. So this this one is, is, is falling a lot to the side, and the other one is not falling as much so maybe maybe let's compensate that just make sure that is okay so now it's it's going side to side the same amount so it feels a bit more natural now and it may be a little too cartoony but it's, that's okay for the purpose of the class and notice the up and down right it's constant it's good <laughs> exactly <laughs> There's a there's a nice rhythm with the up and down, up and down, toop, 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 right? Uh, and I think I'm happy with this for now. I'm also looking at the knees, make sure that they're in the doing the right thing, and it's the right speed. Okay. It could be a little slower. Let's let's make it a little slower. So let's have. Two more frames to each keyframe. One, two, one, two, one, two, two. One, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Just to elaborate on what Daniel was using out there with the brackets, um, it's kind of like if you're familiar with After Effects, there's like a thing called work area. So you can basically define a section. It has nothing to do with the actual animation. It's just um, user interface. Um, it helps you. For example, if you have a narrative or something and you have to adjust something at like 3,000 frames in or something or like yeah. two minutes in, then you can just bracket a section and just work on that section and loop that section. Or Yeah. It's it, really it useful. helps you to navigate. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know you can move the front bracket. That's really useful. Yeah, yeah. It's at the top. It's and there's two types of different brackets. So what he's using is the one from the navigation at the very top. Yep. Um, of uh, right under the frame frame rate, right? And then there's the brackets mm. on the layers, which are more for use for spans, mm. where you can um, open and close like a layer. Yeah, these brackets are meant to make the layer disappear or make the layer appear, right? These are the basically you control the spans. If you yeah, if you yeah. if you saw Goro's tutorial on spans, the spans are basically this the where the drawings are the drawings and your the animation clips. is inside of these boxes that are called spans. And these mm -hmm. boxes they have a beginning and they have an end, right? So if I if I hover here, I can, you can see that it, the cursor becomes a bracket. So that mm -hmm. means, oh, this is the beginning of your span, right? So you mm -hmm. can change that, and you can make the beginning of the span somewhere else, like here. Mm -hmm. So your, my animation is completely invisible until the span begins, right? Oh, well, that's cool. So yeah, that's it's, it's it's kind of a little hard to understand because of the interface. But once yeah, I think you, if you look at the tutorial, the Spanish yeah, tutorial, I look at the tutorial from Goro, yeah, so. and uh, it will become super clear. And also, let's imagine I want this uh, the the whole animation. I want it. I want it to finish here and completely be in, invisible. So I will click this button. Book. So now the animation is ending and it's completely invisible right here. There's nothing there. So meaning the span is finished. But I, if 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 I hover, it shows me. Oh, this is the end of your span, right? So yeah, it's it's kind of and if you wanna reset to it know. back, then you can press the icon next to the trash icon at the top that removes the end point. Yeah, that one. Oh yeah. This icon, what it does is yeah, removes the end point and it was it tells you here it will last forever. So your <laughs> once the animation is finished, it will last forever in the timeline until you tell him to stop again. So <laughs> It's kind of a. That's great to know. It's I kind of hard to that. understand, but once you get it, it's really powerful. All this stuff, especially for things like storytelling, uh, short There's films, so and things many like that. Things that I learn every time. Yeah. <laughs> I've also I've also <laughs> gone ahead and linked I've linked the uh, spans tutorial in the panel text chat for people who easily access. If you're curious. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Tyler. Yeah. Thank you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, shit. Okay. So I made the the cycle a little slower, and I think I like it better. But again, this is more a matter of taste, or a matter of uh, depending on your character. So let's start talking about in betweens, right? What's gonna happen in between all these poses? And let's turn on the the onion skinning is super important for this step, right? So to do it in betweens, I'm gonna start with the right in the middle ones. Uh, and let's see what happens exactly in the middle here. So actually, well, actually it's gonna be better if I just copy this and I paste it right here. Boop. Okay, so between this frame and this one, what's going to happen is this foot is right flat on the ground. And it hey, cuts Daniel, it. just quickly what you just did. You can also just duplicate frame, right? It will insert a frame. Yeah. It will. Yeah. I could have. I could have done this. I could. I could hang on. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. I could go to the middle here, and then press the left trigger. And then, uh, yeah, the alt trigger, ah. then up, and it creates a duplicate of the previous 
uh, drawing yeah. that I had, right? So now, yeah. now number five is exactly the same as number one. Okay. So number five, we're going to edit it. And uh, what happens here is obviously we're going to put this in the middle, but just make sure that the toes are no longer lifted and this foot needs to feel like it's completely flat on the ground. And the leg is going to obviously travel forward. And this... Uh, the body is going up, I believe. No, hang on. Was it going up or going down? Oh no, it's gonna it's gonna start to go down, huh? So we're gonna make the body start to go down because it's the choice that we had done. But like I said before, the passing position could be also a nap position. So I. Here is the in-between in the right leg and the body going down slightly and also going slightly to the side. So make sure it's right in the middle there. And I'm not favoring any frame right now. Favoring, if you saw my last class on last Saturday, means favoring means if I move this in-between closer to the next frame. That means that I'm favoring the next frame, right? But I'm not doing that. I'm wanna, I want to put it right in the middle because we are in constant motion. We are not decelerating, right? The movement is in constant motion. Okay. So the same for, let's see, in between this leg. It's going to be right in the middle. Right in the middle between the two. And here... The toes are going to be the last thing to leave the ground. So the toes are always pointing at the ground right there. Sounds good. Let's go to the next in between, between these two poses. And let's do this. Only one. Okay. And I'm choosing this one because there's no like a, the because there's seven frames. So there are odd numbers. So I had to choose between this or this to make it in the in between, but it doesn't matter. It will. We can always uh, readjust the timing so so each keyframe lasts for the same amount of frames, but it doesn't matter. Let's make sure the in between is properly done. So now just time just time check. It's ten fifty seven for your reference. Oh, so we're almost for one hour, huh? So I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little quicker now, <laughs> but uh, while I'm doing this, if you got any question, it could be a good moment to to do that now. And I'm trying to make sure that the foot is completely flat on the ground. Same here, just really flat, flat on the ground. And I'm gonna keep in between in this. And you guys can talk now. When... Man, there is a lot to learn here. I am loving this. Thank you so much. So 20 years of experience. I thought all I needed was more. Somebody is distorting that like crazy. Yeah, I Faith, I think you're, you're <laughs> lagging just a bit, so you're coming out kind of slow. You sound like T Pain. Oh crap. <laughs> <laughs> well, um Oh, did that slow down too? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're slightly it's like a, it uh, funny. What is it called? Dr say, uh, drunk robot, right? Because it's like you <laughs> I should type it out in the comments and someone can read the question yeah, I can, for me. I I can read it for you. Okay. So Okay, I have to remember. I have to remember to make sure that I'm doing the pose that works on both perspectives, not just the one perspective. <laughs> and that's the issue with 3D animation, right? You have to always be mindful of the. Oh yeah, especially in VR, because I'm sure there's some shortcuts you could probably take in 3D, but still it comes out on like a 2D screen where you could probably get away with some stuff. But in VR. 
if someone's able to view all angles, you have to really make sure it's uh it looks good from every side that people can be seeing it from. You know, interestingly, it's actually it really, that really helpful the fact that um you have to look at it from all angles because um a lot of times when you do two D animation and something is off, sometimes it's really difficult to figure out what exactly is the problem. But then if you, in VR, if you look at it from all angles, like from the top view, from the side view and stuff like that, sometimes it's easy to spot what's going wrong because then, oh, it's off balance, right? That you might not see from a different angle. So it makes uh, animation, like each step, a little bit more digestible. So I feel like it's much friendlier for animators to, to animate in VR because you can um, identify problems much, much better. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I even noticed because I'm keyframing a thing right now, kind of going through this whole process, and uh, I've noticed that having it in 3D and being able to look at it from every angle does make it almost easier to yeah. do in some ways. Um, yeah. But I think the the hard part I have is if it's a really complicated animation, um, staging it and getting the silhouette of each character can be kind of tricky because it's kind of it's a fight scene, so they're kind of all up at each other's grills. Oh, nice. So it's it's like kind of hard to find that perfect angle where you can see everything clearly from versus where maybe in like 2d or on a 2d you know screen you could maybe stage it to where it'd be like more i guess obvious of what every single moment is having behind it yeah in that case it's important for you to really um define the spawn areas beforehand because let's say you go to a boxing match or UFC or something like that, right? Like there will be angles that look awkward or where you, you can't see anything or you only see one guy and you don't see the fight. So it's the same problem in VR, right? So what I usually do for this stuff, I define the spawn areas beforehand so you can check that for all angles, it's a compelling um, silhouette. And obviously there's like always this odd angle where you can't make it work, but that's the same in real life, right? But at least like for the spawn areas you chose, you have compelling um, silhouettes and angles. So that's how I would approach it. Gotcha. Cool. Thanks, Cora. So, yeah. so you check it as you're making it Constantly. spawn areas. Yeah. Hmm. Constantly. Okay. But I also like um, when I did like a Spider-Man animation and um, I just, you know, constantly rotate the camera just so... I in, I can see that the posing and the weight is working, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes I even um, make Spider-Man next to me like life size, and then <laughs> I I become him. So I'm standing next to him and I do the same pose and feel like if the stretches and the f physicality f is is um, accurate, right? Where um, like normally animators would just take reference videos. Uh, the power of VR is, I think, that you can, like, if you don't, if you can't record videos, you can actually use your own body to feel it by just becoming that character, right? Mm. So it's it's like a lot of cool advantages that you have if you work in VR. One thing I found when I was working in VR is you have to kind of think about the wireframe and the bone structure of, like, the character. So if you move, like, say you're moving your arm, and if you move the entire arm versus from where it starts up in the shoulder, um, because it's similar to like stop motion. I don't know if anyone else has had that problem. Totally. And you have to kind of remember that everything, like if you move it off, it'll look awkward that it's coming out of your arm socket. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of what Danielle covered in the beginning, right? Like, it's in this walk that he's doing right now. It's like constant falling, right? It's, it, it comes out of, the movement comes out of a motivation, and that is something that's important to remember. It's not just moving something. You have to know the source and the motivation mm -hmm. behind it. So, Sam, you were saying uh, about copy and, and paste frames. For example, now I have this opportunity here that I need to copy this frame this drawing and I want to I want it to be exactly the same as frame number one so frame number one uh, I'm gonna delete it uh, because frame 30 is the one that I prefer now uh, so I just go to frame 30 uh, select all and on a on an empty frame just press on this button right here so now I have a copy of this 
drawing right here. Right? So that's the method that I use for copy and paste. I wish it was a little bit easier, but that's kind of the way we have to do it right now in, in Quill. Um, because I do it constantly. It's a very... Like, I use it a lot when I'm doing blinking. Yeah. I have to duplicate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Like said, like, if you shift it, it'll look awkward. And you want to make sure that it's consistent. Because the eyes don't move. The eyes usually just stay. Unless you want it to look that way. So I'm going to make the timing very consistent. So each... Each drawing that I've done, I want it to last the same amount of frames. So let's, so that way it will make it a little bit, hopefully the timing will be more consistent. And now frame number 30, I mean, sorry, now it's, it's become 37. It's going to be the same as frame number one. So the loop, I'm going to, just to check, I'm going to, I'm going to stop the loop in here in in the frame um, 36. So when it loops, it will go back to frame number one, which is the same as this, right? And actually, I won't, I won't need this drawing anymore, but I just want to check for now. So now the loop should be uh, working, and it's constant speed, and it's not stopping in any way. At least I don't think it's stopping. Hang on. I think you're missing it. Yeah, there, there is a, there is a, he's, he's stopping here, right? Yeah, these two frames are the same. So, okay, so let, let me delete this. Okay, so now it should be constant. Okay, now it's constant, and it's there's no stopping in any way. Cool. And uh, from the front, it looks a little weird. So now is a good time to fix all of these problems. And the reason is because I didn't look at the at the poses from every angle. <laughs> So now it becomes the work of fixing this stuff, but we have a good base already. So and I feel like here should be falling a bit more. I oh, know, it's okay. Do you tend to have separate layers for the arm movement and the head from the feet? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that maybe in, a, in another, I can do another class maybe because it's such a different subject, how to approach uh, like a walk cycle animation uh, using different layers and how to organize it and all that stuff. I was gonna, I was gonna talk about all of that stuff, but I feel like there's no time. So I wanted to focus more on the principles of walk cycle. But yeah, we can definitely talk about more of that and what's the best way to approach it, right? So here I'm trying to fix spacing issues. If you saw the last, last week's class, I was really uh, more focused on spacing. So here I'm trying to avoid these jumps in spacing to so make sure that they're the spacing is consistent on on each frame, right? And you can feel now how the body sways side to side on each step. And that's working nicely the way I want it. There's a bit of a spacing jumps here with the leg going a little bit too high. But we can fix that quickly with a grab tool. Obviously all of that stuff comes in later and I, I, I'm not even done with all the in-betweens but I, fixing all the stuff now will help me get better in-betweens later 
So here from the side, you, we can see the up and down movement and the forward motion. Uh, we can feel the ground moving constantly, right? Maybe this maybe this spacing is a little too high, too too crazy. Maybe let's turn it down a little bit. Oh, hang on, what am I doing? No, this is the planting position. This is the, the stride position, and this is the planting. Very important to have a big difference between striding and then the planting. So the foot really feels like it stumps on the ground. Huh? And the more cartoony you do this, sometimes the better. So, you can really feel that foot stuff planting on the ground. Boom. Let's play back. Okay. Awesome. It's looking nice. And then before we finish, one last trick, and then we can just finish the whole thing. Uh, I realized that I didn't make the body lean forward. So normally when, when a character walks, there's a, it depend, depends on the character, depends on the personality, but a good thing to do sometimes is lean the body a little bit forward. So I'm gonna do that now by just holding the selection and then selecting all the frames while uh, the, the playback is on, right? So it's playing back and it's selecting everything at the same time. So. I start the playback, but I still have all the selection of all the drawings, but not just not everything, just the the thing that I clicked, the body, right? So now I can just freely move the body and do this change, and that will stay for the whole animation, that change. So that's a good trick also to bear in mind. Great okay. trick. So I realize it's a little off balance now, so... Just gonna put it right back there. Okay. Um, maybe next week I'll go and maybe do more in betweens on this and talk about the arm and talk about the arm swing and talk about the head. How does that react to the walk cycle? Yeah, I think um, what's interesting for me if you would cover like the follow throughs next time, right? Like um. If you make a cycle like this in place, you know, if there's an, I was always wondering if there's an easy way, you know, you post the head first synchronized to the walk up and downs, right? But then you want to offset them. And once you offset them, you kind of break the cycle. So I ended up like creating new keyframes to crop the cycle, if that makes sense. But I, I mean, it gets a little bit too into too much into the nitty gritty. But if you can cover that next time, that would be cool. Yeah, you can totally do the, the frame. Uh, you can totally do the head animation in, within the same um, drawings that you already have here. So yeah. these are your base drawings. These are the basic animation drawings, and and in those drawings, you can you can add all the stuff, the follow through, all the all the little things in there even if it's not really detailed but you can have that here but obviously once we're in between even more you can start offsetting each uh, each animation so they have different timings and stuff right yeah All do right. you recommend oh sorry no no yeah <laughs> say yeah I was going to say, do you recommend us doing a 2D exercise of this and then doing it in Quill? Because um, I was doing a ball bounce in 2D, like on Toon Boom. And um, I was thinking about transferring that to um, Quill. Or do you think we could just go into Quill and do this, like based off of what you just done? I would say go to Quill directly. I mean, the animation tools are very similar to any other 2D. A program. Also, I think one thing it does for you is like it removes the worry about the drawing, 
you know, because you can reuse the same thing. So if you do something in Toon Boom, then you also have to worry about your drawing, that they look all right, right, every mm -hmm. time. Um, the, the advantage of, like, um, doing this directly in Quill is that you can um, make the learning experience more digestible. So you can just focus on, now I focus on movement only, right, because the drawing is, stays the same. And the volume mm -hmm. stays the same, so you don't have to worry about perspective and stuff like that. You know, it's already given, so you can really focus on what you want to learn. So mm -hmm. I think um, it's actually a huge advantage to do that in um, in VR directly, especially like um, if you would struggle like in drawing, for example. Like for me, I'm not very like drawing is not my strength. Mine is more like light and color, right? So in perspective and drawing and stuff like that is still something I struggle with from time to time. Like if you ask me to do like a turntable of a character in 2D, I'm gonna die, you know, because it's just like <laughs> super, super difficult to do. Um, so obviously people like Glenn Keen, they can just they, they can just wing it, right? And do it on the spot. But that's because they have years and years of training right. in their craft. And I think the advantage of um, VR is that you can break it down into more digestible pieces. So I would also suggest to do it directly in VR. Mm, okay. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining in. Uh, Thanks for time, man. I'm going to upload thank the video you. eventually on YouTube. I hope you guys Great. enjoyed it. Let me stop the recording right now. So this is the end of the class.